everyone. We're here at the Caribbean Developers Conference, and I'm here with my friend Clemens, who's going to talk to us about messaging. And he's a messaging expert. So everything I've learned about this topic, I've learned from this gentleman <laughs> right here. So I definitely appreciate having the moment to sit down and talk to you. I'm, I'm uh, pleased and uh, honored to talk to you. So I know who you are, but I don't know if everyone else that's watching knows who you are. So maybe you can give us like a really quick 30 second, like who are you and what do you do right now? Um, I'm the lead architect for all the messaging services and eventing services in the Azure cloud mm -hmm. um, and for Microsoft all up. Um, and in that role, I'm also uh, participating in several standardization organizations, MQTT, MQP or two protocols. Yeah. Um, and then also in the CNCF, uh, I'm the quasi architect of uh, the cloud event project. Gotcha. So one of the things I have to ask you, like what are you doing here at the Caribbean Developers Conference? Like what's the thing <laughs> that brought you to this, this place? Um, I, after the pandemic, um, I decided that um, I want to get a bit more on the conference trail than I've been uh, before. Um, before I've been mostly going to conferences where I was invited, so I, I watched on, I, I checked kind of open CFPs and said, this would be a great conference, and then talked to a few friends mm -hmm. um, and said, you know, have you been to the conference? And they said, it's a great place, so go. So That's fantastic. Now I'm here after a 10 and a half hour flight from Germany. Wow. Yes. Also, hopefully your recommendation from your friends was a good one and hopefully you enjoy yourself. And, oh, this uh, is a, th yeah, this is a great forward. conference. That's fantastic. Yeah. So I know you're a, you're focused a lot on messaging. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I've always wanted to ask you is, well, what was the thing that kind of led you down the path to focus on, on messaging and messaging protocols? Mm -hmm. um, in my, in, at the start of my career, I've been working for about nine years in financial, um, a software mm -hmm. um, for both um, credit application management and for uh, financial collections. Mm -hmm. the, the light side and the dark side <laughs> of, of credit, of, credit right. uh, um, uh, of the credit business. And um, as we were doing this, we were kind of, this was the start, the start of the client server period where you have mm -hmm. now all of a sudden stuff was just shifting down to the server, you had a database, and then this notion of application servers started to come around and I got interested in um, you know, making those things interoperable. So I got into this whole XML uh, web services community mm -hmm. and started there. And then eventually uh, Microsoft um, offered me an interesting job and I said, okay, so I'll sure, do this. Sure, why not, let's do it. <laughs> um, so, it was, so originally I come from the, I come from the uh, um, SOAP XML web services kind of corner, and that's kind of was my start into this whole messaging arena. Okay. Um, and then as we were building out of this team at Microsoft Windows Communication Foundation, a little um, incubation in 2006, um, where the idea was, okay, so now we have this standard, but you have company A and company B, and they have all their stuff behind firewalls, how can they even talk? Yeah. And so we need to have a, a notion of where you have kind of neutral somewhere on the internet, a place where you can go and make rendezvous those. Sure. That was the, the, the original idea behind the Azure Relay before cloud services were even a thing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but the thing has survived. Um, and we, you know, we started an incubation in 2007 mm -hmm. or in 2006 and the thing still ships. So that's how I got in that. And then, of course, we started layering more and more messaging elements to it. So now I had a message broker, an event stream broker. So effectively, as these things became fashion, like Kafka 2010, 2011, and starting, and, or, or what projects that were starting, we kind of picked up similar patterns over time. So we've been basically growing up with this whole trend. You mentioned earlier that you were interested in making sure that like all of these things talk together. Mm -hmm. And I think a big part of that has to do with, with standards and protocols. And, yes. And having you know, implementations of those protocols that everyone can equally speak to on either side. Correct. And so I'm guessing that's where you started to get involved with things like AMQP and another messaging things mm -hmm. to kind of plug those worlds together. Yes. Is that correct? Um, that's because interoperability was kind of, is, is where I came from, mm -hmm. kind of in this whole space. I, I said, XML, SOAP, all these, these, 
th this were all interoperability standards, however complicated it may have been, mm -hmm. um, but the goal was to make things inter interoperate. So that has always been my passion and all. And I've mostly, even though I've joined Microsoft during the dark time, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it's always been um, OSS, mm -hmm. And uh, you know, openness has always been kind of the driving motivation for me. Mm -hmm. Like I, I built the first BSD licensed larger application on on the .NET framework with that's blog the blogging app, yeah. the blogging application. Mm -hmm. um, so that has always been a thing even before Microsoft got all into into OSS. It's open source, yeah. Um, so yeah, so interoperability, making sure that things interoperate is something that has always been important for me because I believe that we can only gain, Microsoft with our products, we can only gain if um, uh, you know, there's broad interoperability with what customers run on premises, with cu what customers run in other clouds, with what customers run here, because there is no single place where people will go and execute their stuff and then they need to be able to go and interconnect all their different applications and the best way to do that is through implementation neutral open standards. Okay, and so now when I'm thinking about messaging and, and protocols, obviously I think about AMQP, mm -hmm. right? Were you involved in the creation of that standard at all or is it just a, a team now that you work closely with because you have to implement that now inside of you know, the products you work on? Um, during the development of AMQP, uh, my good friend David Ingham, who is now at Red Hat, um, has been the participant in the, the Oasis working group for Microsoft. Um, and he's been, he, he should get the credit for most of the work that has been done there. Um, Rob Godfrey, who is um, also at Red Hat, he used to be at JP Morgan, um, is probably the, the, the father of NQP in the sense that um, he's been kind of driving lots of the philosophy behind it. Mm -hmm. So I've been um, I've been lucky to uh, uh, you know work with those guys, and uh, but I had a bit of input I would say on on the Microsoft side while David was doing that work. So we 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 already had existing product um, while AMQB was figured out, and yeah. of course you know Dave and I have been in in constant uh, exchange on things that we wanted or needed. Gotcha. Um, but now I'm kind of the co-chair of uh, of the MQP technical committee, mm -hmm. and in the last um, five years, four years, we've done a lot of the companions extra specs for MQP mm -hmm. that made it possible for um, our implementation and um, the implementation of the ActiveMQ and the implementation of Apache Q of Apache Cupid those three brokers mm -hmm. for the client implementation, especially JMS, mm -hmm. to be exactly the same code. So we, we standardize the wire so much right. that we can go and build a common client for something as complicated and demanding as the JMS standard. And that would, so that's quite the achievement. So those are all extensions that, yeah. of which some of which I've, wrote and, I've written completely. That's fantastic. But kind of like what you said, like if there's a common protocol that we can all speak to, then that means that our clients should be able to speak to all of these yes. different implementations, and and that was and that was the goal. That was the goal of that. So to be able to 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 share the client stack, mm -hmm. even for something as complex as JMS, because JMS is a standard that has been um, so Java Message Service, sure, um, that has been uh, built kind of in an ivory tower setting. I would say um, 10, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, the, the first version, and well, probably even earlier than that. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's time flies. It does, um, and uh, it's it's kind of difficult to go and implement it correctly uh, and completely, and that we're able to do this with AMQP and able to do this with with a joint stack. That is an achievement for for the standardization work with the, under under the covers. That's amazing. So as we think about developers now. What do you think is important for developers to know about AQP? Because um, is it something that I need to be concerned about? Or should I just be like, hey, I, I'm going to use an AQP compliance SDK or library, and then I'm just going to leave the rest of it to the implementation? Um, most developers will use a library that's, that's, that's leveraging AQP. Mm -hmm. 
um, you can you can go down to the details of it mm -hmm. and you can go and use a, a raw AMQP stack and just interact with all the pieces. Yeah. Uh, most developers will practically speaking use some kind of an abstraction. The the strength the strength of having that that having that standard is that you can have, as I said, common clients. Mm -hmm. Um, that you ha can have interoperability between brokers. Um, RabbitMQ, um, I have to point that out, is um, using AMQP, but they are using an older version, mm -hmm. um, 0.9.2, which was abandoned at some point by the AMQP technical committee, right. but Rabbit uh, keeps using that one mm -hmm. um, as their primary protocol, but they have now a credible implementation of AMQP1, and that actually demonstrates really well, and we have that on, on, in our documentation for, for Azure Service Bus, that you can run RabbitMQ on, on you know, anywhere where we like, and then there's a, there's a, there's a, a process called the shovel. Mm -hmm. You can turn on and configure, use the AMQP plugin, and then you can go and basically copy information from queues that live in Rabbit over to queues that live in, in Service Bus, mm -hmm. and vice versa which means you can now create a communication channel between those two brokers so that your application can go and locally use RabbitMQ if it wants to, but you can go and still okay. then um, make sure that that lands in the cloud where you need it and you can process it with whatever you want. And that broker-to-broker -broker communication, that is enabled by having that standard. And, um, and so that's almost like a, like a forwarding pattern. Like mm -hmm. I, I send it to one broker and then now, like you said, I set up the shovel Yes. Right. And now it's able to, cause that, so I don't have to do anything personally. That's right. Like I don't have to be a part of that communication at all. The brokers would talk to each other mm -hmm. and figure it out. Yes. Right. And, th and that becomes more and more, since you were talking about like trends and, mm -hmm. and, and what, what do developers need to know? Um, we, like the pendulum has swung pretty far in the direction of cloud, mm -hmm. um, certainly also at Microsoft, mm -hmm. meaning um, we put, we made everything cloud, and then over that, maybe we didn't pay too much attention to the things that are happening on premises. Yeah, that's kind of now kind of fi finding swinging back a little bit, uh -huh. um, out of the realization that um, customers need on-premises processing. True, sure. um, and I think those hybrid scenarios are important too, right? Because and, yes. like we're not going to be all in one or the other. Correct. I have a little bit here and a little bit over here. Yeah, yes. So I should be able to like mix my environments yes. together and interoperate and message between those systems using like those protocols that we spoke yeah. about. So first is it you you operate a uh, let's say you have a restaurant chain, mm -hmm. and you still want to make sure that you can go and serve your customers in the restaurant while the internet connection is down. Right. <laughs> but. But you have now you have now uh, accumulated a bunch of bills um, that you have uh, you know have been issued transactions that have been executed, and now the internet connect, connection comes back, and then you want to go and, and put that into central accounting. Yeah. Well, then you want to want the messages to be routed to the central system, which is then probably cloud-based. But there's so much stuff that can be do done asynchronously, where you don't need to have an active connection to just keep working locally. And for that, these asynchronous communication paths where you have a broker locally, where you have some infrastructure locally, are useful. So that we don't get into the situation that customers sometimes find themselves in today where everything is on the network, Yeah. Um, that you know, local business doesn't work anymore just because the internet connection is down. Because the internet connection is down. I, it reminds me of one of my first, um, one of my first projects that I worked with that had to do with any type of messaging at all. So I, I used to work at a, a finance company and it was essentially like, I don't know if all finance companies are like this, but this was a collection of other acquisitions that made this one company. They mm -hmm. might have been like five or six different acquisitions. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason why that detail is important is because each of those different companies had a different stack. Yes. So I walked into the environment as a .NET person, but then there was Ruby and there was PHP and there was Python mm -hmm. and there was like a stack for like everything. Right, and then every different part of the business, you know, it might have been like the stock ticker or something else mm -hmm. was written in a different thing. And so they had a, a system in the middle built on RabbitMQ and some other things, Redis and some other things in the middle that enable that interoperability between those different systems. So instead of me calling like web API endpoints, you know, we will publish messages into the bus mm -hmm. and then the, you know, whatever service was happened to be listening to the time 
you know, we'll process that and then it'll create like a reply queue, mm -hmm. whatever the case is. But then now I'm like, oh wow, I can really see the power of messaging. Because at first you could tell me you have all these different languages. I'm like, how is this gonna work? Like you have all of these different systems together. How yeah. am I supposed to talk to the PHP person or you know the Java person or whatever the case is if we're all running on different web stacks yeah. and all these types of things? Yeah, we're we're enabling these things in in the cloud with the services that we have, and you can go and you know also have a, a virtual broker, a namespace as we call them, yeah. um, you know, in, in this region and that region and that region mm -hmm. um, across the world. Um, we have uh, a replication task as we call them, where you can go and copy a queue to another queue, um, uh, and, and we have routes. So you can go and create yeah. fairly complex uh, uh, routing meshes, if you will, um, that then accommodate things like this, where you have sure. you know, different applications that are running on different stacks, running in different geographies, for legal reasons, whatever, but they need still need to go and communicate yeah. uh, and communicate um, uh, um, safely and securely. Many of these, especially banking apps, run in in isolated network environments, yeah. VNets, mm -hmm. right? And and you don't want anything to communicate into those VNets. So being able yeah. to basically use the 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 queues as a bridge between those environments is a very safe way of communicating. So we see that a lot. Nice. No, I know AMQP has been around for, for quite a while, mm -hmm. right? And I, I know over time, like you add different features to it, you know, add different specifications to the standards mm -hmm. and whatnot. I know sometime relatively recently, um, there was support for scheduled messaging or delayed delivery messaging, something similar mm -hmm. to that fact. What are some of the other things that are being thought about in to be included into the protocol and to the standard? Um, we have, um, we have done a lot of work in the last four years. Um, scheduling was, was one feature that we added. Um, we added um, several connection management features. We added, um, we finalized the addressing specification, mm -hmm. meaning there is now a URI format for MQP. People have been using that before, but it wasn't formalized, and now we have mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we finalized several specs, I think like 11, which are all companion specs. And now Rob and I have, been, have decided that we want to have the dust settle for a while. And we've done that before. In, so the prior activity phase, basically, that I got into like the tail end of it was kind of the first, like the MQP1 phase. Yeah. Um, for any of these specs, we have not, we found no reason to touch the core spec, which is okay. great, which shows how, um, how forward-looking, extensible that that spec was. So we didn't even have errata that we need to go and add. Mm -hmm. um, so now we're in a phase where Rob and I, as the chairs, meet every four weeks or so, mm -hmm. um, and then talk about whether we have anything. But for now, we're kind of done. Yeah. And I think we're going to have a next phase of activity, maybe two, three years down the road. What's important in the standards is first patience, mm -hmm. because. Uptake takes time, mm -hmm. and B, don't change too much. Yeah. So we're, we're deliberate in saying, no, 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 what we have is pretty good now. Mm -hmm. Let's see how people go and implement it. Right. And then, and then even kind of driving these extension specs towards you know, higher level of standardization, making them a formal OASIS standard, making them maybe an ISO standard, all these phases. Right. We're like, let's see what people do with it, Let's see feedback from basically real life use, and then we can go and take those next next steps. So we're, we're super patient people. That's good. So AMQP, we're just talking about like the protocol that like goes over the wire. Mm -hmm. But I know it's another standard that you're involved in is cloud events. Correct. Right, and the cloud events is a little bit different, right? Because now we're talking about like that wrapper, or we're talking about like an envelope of which we're using to send messages, right? Yes. Now I know this one's a little bit of a newer standard, right? So could you tell folks a little bit about? Like, what was the motivation behind creating that? Um, the, the Google folks came to us and came to others and said, hey, we would like to have a common way of defining what an event is. Um, and we have a proposal. Yeah. And we said, we'll look at it. Um, and then there was, well, the group found each other after a while. Mm -hmm. The IBM got involved and, and a few others and said, we should go and do that. 
Yeah. And uh, out came then uh, this, this definition of what an event is, which was a fight of one and a half years of like landing at seven attributes in the end. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of argument I could about, about <laughs> landing into these seven attributes plus yeah. the data section. Yeah. Um, but the motivation was that um, we all share the vision that if you raise an event in a system, that event travels a long way in a system, often through multiple hops, they get aggregated, they get forwarded, they get inspected and forwarded, and uh, they need to be dispatched. They come from very, very, very many different sources. They need to go and get to the same kind of code, to the same infrastructure. So you need to have a common way of thinking about them. Yeah. And you also need to have a common uh, model for how to map that event to you know, various protocols yeah. so that you can send it originally over, AMK, over AMKP, um, then you pick it up, but then you need to forward it over HTTP, and you pick it up over HTTP, and you can't have any loss between those things. Yeah. And also, if you go and um, send the event um, uh, using JSON, okay, everybody knows JSON, but there's customers, there's people who want to use something more compact, protobuf, mm -hmm. Avro, how do you express that? Mm -hmm. um, then there is the need often to not even use any of these encodings, but really take the the message uh, format right. of yeah. HTTP or the message format of MQTT mm -hmm. and take the cloud event and just map it straight onto that transport message. Right. So we have all these different requirements. Um, and so we work through what that means to make sure that we can do this in a lossless way um, to, cr to move events around effectively. Okay. And that has been, um, uh, a very interesting journey, and we see cloud events being picked up now slowly, mm -hmm. um, but it shows up more and more customers are looking at it at a way to go and just standardize their internal zoo of events for business events that they run in their applications. Yeah. So uh, also here, we've been starting this work now five years ago, and uptake now happens, and we have the patience for believing that um, uh, people will pick it up more. That's nice. I know um, the Dapper folks, right, mm -hmm. use cloud events and they use it a lot for tracing and routing, mm -hmm. which I think is really interesting. So like that has been my first, um, you know, the first set of experiences that I've had with cloud events is using through Dapper yeah. because that's by default, like that's how they send messages through. Yeah. And, you know, looking at the payload, like you said, like it's only a few attributes. It's not, there's not a lot of stuff in there, but I can see how that stuff is useful. Again, kind of giving context and giving like a very well-defined shape of like, what does it mean to be a message or an event, right? Mm -hmm. Like, what does it mean to send things, not just over HTTP, but just to send things over any, you know, any transport mechanism? Because like you said, there's, there's Avro, there's Protobuf, there's JSON over HTTP, like these different things. And so I think being able to have that, that uniform contract is, is going to be very helpful. And yeah. I'd definitely love to see like more products pick it up over time. Yeah, it's, um, it's just, it's a convention that makes it, um, that makes it simpler to write code that's handling event, simpler that writes to write infrastructure that's moving events. Right. Because you can now rely on certain fields that are in the message, and no matter what that message format is or how it's mapped onto the various transport messages, you can rely on a certain shape, and um, you can also write now basically common libraries of events. Mm -hmm. Definitions of events right. that your applications can use, and that's the next. That's the current work that we're doing in the in the group. Um, also here, we have cloud events. One O is done. Mm -hmm. We're doing some errata here and there because people are asking, and then we kind of find some some glitches that we have in the spec. Yeah. But we are pretty committed not to do a 2.0. Yeah. Well, <laughs> um, we're doing the work. Like John Skeet is one of the guys on the on the group. Mm -hmm. um, who is pretty insistent on creating a uh, you know versioning story mm -hmm. for how the versioning will eventually work, mm -hmm. but we're all very keen on never having to do that. Right. So, <laughs> but um, so active work is um, that we're trying to create a format um, discovery format mm -hmm. where you can describe these events. So today, when you have you know go on on our website, Azure, and you find all the events that are being raised mm -hmm. by the various services, 
There's a quasi-formal way in the documentation of describing what those events are, but there's no machine-readable formal document. To, to be able to see how to do it. Yes. So I'm guessing at some point, like, there'll be, like, an events registry. Correct. Like, you know, for all the events in my system, here's where they are, this is what they look like. Yes. You can validate the schema and look at the shape and the required properties and those types of things. Yes. But I could do that without necessarily having to actually send a message. Like, I could just call a registry API or something yeah, of that and, sort. Yeah, and then you okay. can co-generate. So that's, so that's why we, that's why we are. Um, we are, I would say like 95% done with that initial spec. Okay. Um, and the goal would be that you can, you have a message broker of any sort, let's say ours, Azure Service Bus, sure. and they have queue on it, and that queue is, is meant to carry events. You, sh you, you will th then be able to go and put a URI, mm -hmm. kind of a metadata URI on that queue, mm -hmm. which points to the collection of messages, mm -hmm. the message definitions that can be sent to that queue and that can, should be expected from that queue. Yeah. And all of a sudden, once you have this and it's, you point to a document and that's, that's attached to the queue, you can create, you could code gen mm -hmm. a client that has all the message definitions, mm -hmm. Um, and that has typed, um, typed uh, objects. Ty ty yeah, cool. Typed objects that you can now send instead of sending messages. That's awesome. And you can do this over you know many different languages. If someone needs to go write the code generator, sure, right? of course. But then you know over time, um, you should be able to create a type safe experience around those events in polyglot languages, and then make application developers' life easier because dealing with you know raw messages is still a bit of a it's. It's difficult for many, you know, corporate application developers because it's extra ceremony that they need to deal with, and um, um, it's a source of errors. Yeah. And if we can go and, and just help eliminating that source of errors with more code gen, that's great. Sure. That'd so be just we're one trying less to make that for possible. folks to think yeah. about. All right. Yeah. And that sounds like a, a really interesting project for um, the source generator feature that's inside of .NET. So I know they have that way they could generate like these different source code files. Mm -hmm. So it'd be interesting to see a project that like looks at specs and uh, I'm going to generate implementations or at least concrete types based on what's inside of the spec. Um, the, the tool that I'm using for generating um, uh, code out of open API definitions in .NET is nswag. Uh -huh. um, and so I'm also using nswag kind of as part of my prototype. Mm -hmm. Um, to at least go and create the the um, out of whatever I have in JSON mm -hmm. in JSON schema to yeah. kind of code gen uh, the the, the types for that. Yeah. Um, and since what we're defining is it's not quite open API because we're not we're not concerned about the in, the interdependencies of calls. Yeah. Async API has a similar thing where they also think of the interdependency between calls. Um, so we're kind of le a level below this. We're basically just saying, here's a set of events, mm -hmm. and you can send them or you can receive them. Yeah. But we don't worry about the contract per se. Got it. And um, so, but they, they're similar enough that I can go and use some N swag as a as a foundation for as a test, bed, for, as right test bed to start with those things, and then we'll see. Um, uh, eventually, uh, hopefully, someone will uh, you know. Pick up, pick that up, pick and, it up and, 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 and create a code generator. We, we have some internal teams right now, kind of looking at this, mm -hmm. um, but um, uh, not quite. There's not quite a date, and there's not quite a hard plan for how this is sure. going to go. But. That's understandable. So you, we spoke about a lot of things. We talked about AMQP and, and cloud events. If folks want to get involved in these communities, mm -hmm. maybe they want to communicate with the board or share their thoughts and ideas about how those specs are going. Is there a place that they could go to or a message board or do they have Discord channels and things of that nature that they could come and communicate? So for cloud events, you go to github.com slash cloud events slash spec. Mm -hmm. um, that on the readme page, there is um, our meeting schedule. Mm -hmm. um, everybody's welcome to join. You don't need to be a CNCF member. We have a, um, in every meeting, there's a community hour slot. Mm -hmm. So if you just show up and have a question, then you can go and raise your hand right yeah. in that meeting and um, all the experts are there and you can get their, your question answered. Okay. Also, if you have feedback. Um, so that's, and then in, um, there's also Slack channel. So all the resources kind of on that, on that page. Got it. Um, for AMQP, 
Um, there are, and, and for MQTT, you need to be a member of Oasis to be kind of just in, get in super the, engaged. Yeah. Um, in general, if you need to have links to all the standards and all the documents, I have made a, uh, a repo also with a readme um, on GitHub, github.com slash Clemens V mm -hmm. slash messaging. Um, and so I have links to various standards, various efforts um, where you can go and participate if you want to. That'd be great. And so what we could do, we can grab some of those links and put them in the description mm -hmm. of the video. So for folks that want to take a look at those, they could do that. Yeah, great. Fantastic. Awesome. Thank well, you. thank you so much for coming on. Definitely appreciate it. It was fun. It's always fun talking to you. And for folks, thank you so much for watching. Again, we're at the Caribbean Developers Conference, and we just spoke to Clemens. He talked to us about how we can use messaging in our apps and about some of the protocols we should be paying attention to. So take care. Thank you. Thank you.